All right, for unit two, we're gonna discuss the Gilded Age. First, we'll start off with immigration and urbanization. So let me present. All right, getting to the US. This is gonna discuss a lot of um, immigrants. Now, the difference between immigration during this period of time versus now is that these immigrants who came to the United States did so legally. They came through ports in San Francisco or New York and they became citizens, okay? Um, so getting to the U.S., most immigrants arrived by steamship because planes were not really, um, they were not a thing yet, okay? We didn't really have planes yet. Um, most stayed in steerage, which were like the very bottom of the ship. That was the cheapest ticket. In steerage, it was crowded, windowless, hot, loose, which are lice-infested beds, and these people shared toilets. A lot of people, or some of them, died from disease before they even got to the United States, and unfortunately what would happen is if they died, people would just throw them overboard. So if you look here, these are German immigrants boarding a ship in 1874. And this is another picture. This is a horrors of the immigrant ship in 1869. And it's just showing um, the horrible pictures of the steerage area, the bottom area that these people went through just to get to the United States. Religious persecution. So in 1820, you had about 3,000 uh, Jews living in the United States. However, in 1880, um, that number increased to 300,000 Jews living in the United States. Jews faced violence in many European countries. Between 1881 and 1924, two and a half million Jews were driven out of Eastern Europe. Many came to the United States to escape violence and practice their religion. Because in the United States, your freedom of religion is protected. This is a picture of Jews from Germany in 1876. Poverty. Farmers saw fewer profits and that cheaper American grains were imported into Europe. This caused crop failures and a lot of farmers and farm laborers lost their jobs. Now if you look at the bottom pictures here, these are Irish peasants in 1880. Um, so my family, for example, um, descended from Scots Irish. Uh, we'll talk about how poorly the Irish were treated. Oh, and they thought they would find agricultural work in the United States. Unemployment. So these are all reasons why immigrants came from other countries to the United States. For example, there was an increase in Europeans, uh, sorry, Europe's population, which led to job shortages. The unemployed could not buy the necessities to take care of themselves or their families. And they ended up coming to the United States to find work. If you look here, these are immigrants from Eastern Europe on the deck of the SS Amsterdam. Political unrest. These are other things that were happening um, in other countries that caused people to leave. So many political revolutions happened across Europe and Europeans left so they could become or live independent lives. The European governments limited the number of professionals and men of military age from uh, leaving. So what happened is you had a lot of females who would come first, and then when the males could leave or get away, they would. And this just shows a map of kind of places they went, okay? This was a map used by German immigrants in 1853. New York is here. Okay, between 1850 and 1910, large number of Europeans came to the United States. So if you look here on our little pie charts, all right, the red represents Northwestern Europe and the South, I'm sorry, the blue represents Southeastern Europe. Before 1880, most were from Western and Northern Europe. However, between 1850 and 1880, you had around 3.6 million Irish, Germans accounted for 3.6 million, and English, who were 1.8 million. After 1880, a number from uh, Southern and Euro Eastern Europe increased. So by the 1880s, almost two and a half million immigrants left Italy, Austria, Russia, and Sweden. 
By the 1890s, about 3 million left Austria, Italy, and Germany. And between 1900 and 1910, immigration from Italy, Austria, and Russia reached its peak with almost 6 million leaving, and most of these people were Jewish. So what was happening at this point? The U.S. began passing laws that started to limit the number of people that could, have, could come to the United States, and they have the right to do that, okay? Almost one million people came into the U.S. in 1882. So what happened was Congress passed the Immigration Act of 1882, which decreased the number of immigrants that were allowed to enter the United States legally. It also imposed a head tax of 50 cents that had to be paid by all immigrants who entered through U.S. ports. This means that it created a set of criteria um, that immigrants had to meet in order to be admitted. Okay, Typically, if you are allowing immigrants into your country, you want to make sure that those immigrants will um, put down roots and they will actually thrive. Okay, um, Unfortunately, over the years, the welfare state in the United States has increased heavily and that means higher taxes and it means less people who are actually paying into the system and more people who are taking from the system. So this is why when you have immigrants come to your country, you kind of want to have some regulations. Um, you want to make sure that these people are going to be able to contribute. And I'm not talking about, um, you know, uh, working class jobs. Um, we want doctors, we want lawyers, we want people who will actually come and help the country thrive. Okay, so we talk about Ellis Island. Okay, yeah. Most immigrants came through Ellis Island on the East Coast. New York Harbor, um, this is a picture of Ellis Island, okay. Um, New York Harbor and opened in 1892. That was where the main processing center was in the United States from 1892 to 1924. By 1924, almost 17 million immigrants had been processed here. That means that they had completed paperwork. Um, they were named, their names were on record, okay? <clears throat> so this is what happened when they got to Ellis Island. This is a picture from inside Ellis Island of immigrants waiting for processing. So. Immigrants were examined, questioned, and all their documents were inspected. It usually took three to seven hours, but 20% of the immigrants were held for at least a day before processing began. So, unfortunately, contagious disease or mentally unfit people were sent back home to their home country. An inspector would question them to determine if they met legal requirements to be admitted into the United States. Um, people who, they were looking for people who had never convicted a felony, that were able to work, and who had some money in their pockets. As little as 2% of immigrants were denied entry. Now this is where we come to the other major, excuse me, the other major uh, port. Asians came to the United States to strike it rich. Um, we'll talk about the California Gold Rush. The largest group was Chinese. You had about 300,000 that arrived between 1850 and 1883. Many Chinese were hired by railroad companies and they paid much less than white workers, or were paid much less than white workers. So after the railroads were finished, many became farmers, they worked in mines, or they became domestic servants. So if you look here, these are pictures. This again, this is Harper's Weekly. I've told you about this kind of famous uh, newspaper magazine. And this is another picture of Chinese immigration to the U.S. in 1876. Oh, okay. Japanese immigration to the U.S. increased in 1898 when the U.S. annexed, basically took control, of the Hawaiian Islands. Many Japanese moved to Hawaii to work on plantations, which were typically sugarcane plantations, in 1884. When Hawaii became part of the United States, they moved to California because of higher wages. From 1907, you had 30,000 Japanese who arrived on the West Coast, and by 1920, more than 200,000 Japanese families lived on the West Coast. And this is a picture of Japanese immigrants living in Hawaii. Angel Island. Okay, so we know that Ellis Island was port in New York, 
Angel Island, on the other hand, was in San Francisco, California. Immigrants often spent weeks or months waiting to be granted entry. Some even waited years in dirty living conditions. 18% of Asian immigrants were denied entry at Angel Island. Most of them were Chinese. This is a picture of Angel Island, sorry. Okay. Okay. Immigrants at Angel Island were asked more questions and had to be more specific in their answers. They also had to have American witnesses or family members come to Angel Island to support their responses. This made it very difficult for immigrants who arrived on the West Coast to be granted entry into the United States. And then we, of course, have discrimination. Okay. During this time, um, unfortunately, whites believe that Asians were taking their jobs because they would work for lower wages. Where have you heard that before? Um, it's 2020. The same argument is made for, um, you know, Hispanic uh, immigrants. Uh, the Chinese Ex Exclusion Act of 1882 restricted Chinese immigration to the United States for 10 years. In 1892, the law was extended another 10 years. And by 1902, the law was extended without an end date, and it was not repealed until 1943. So that means they were not able to come to the United States. Okay. Discrimination. Nope. School systems in San Francisco segregated Japanese children by putting them in separate schools in 1906. The Japanese government um, was furious. President Theodore Roosevelt made a deal with the Japanese government. This was known as the Gentleman's Agreement, and it was between 1907 and 1908, and during that time, Japan limited the number of unskilled Japanese that left Japan, and the U.S. then repealed school segregation in San Francisco. Mexican Immigration Mexican immigrants also wanted to find work and earn higher wages. They also wanted to escape political unrest. By 1930, 700,000 Mexican immigrants had entered the United States. By 1902, um, they had the National Reclamation Act, which created farmland in the southwestern United States. So what happened was many Mexicans came to the United States to work as manual laborers, cattle herders, and cartmen. This is an example of a cartman. Okay, he's traveling to the United States, 1912. All right, more discrimination, unfortunately. Mexican Americans who legally owned land had it taken away by whites. I'm going to butcher this name, I apologize. Las Garas Blancas, the White Caps, was a group formed in New Mexico in 1889, and they attempted to reclaim their land through violence. Other Mexican Americans, however, took legal action. Both groups failed. Congress then passed what were known as Sunday Laws, which banned cultural gatherings in Mexican-American communities. Congress also passed greaser laws, which allowed any unemployed Mexican-American to be imprisoned for vagrancy or homelessness charges. You could actually be arrested for being homeless. Okay. Societal effects. Between 1870 and 1920, over 20 million people or immigrants entered the United States, which then increased urbanization. Immigrants faced many hardships. Many or most were not fluent in English. They had to find a place to live, work, and complete day-to-day -day living tasks, which was very hard. If you look at the picture to the left, it says, photo of a steerage deck where immigrants usually traveled. Okay, so this, these are the immigrants underneath, all right? Many sought out others from their home countries. Ethnic communities were established that spoke their native language. They established places of worship, and they formed social clubs and orphanages. If you look at the picture at the bottom, this is the uh, Turnverin building. I think I pronounced that wrong. It was built in 1914, and it was a men's club for German Americans. All right, societal effects. They tried to maintain their own culture in these communities. Some started their own newspapers. Many did not think of themselves as part American. 
Irish American, German American, Italian American. I'm sorry, they thought of themselves as part American. New cultural items were introduced by American society. For example, you can thank immigrants for all of these things. Polish polkas, Italian operas, hamburgers, spaghetti, frankfurters, Russian literature, and kindergarten. This is a picture to the left of Chinatown, which is an area in San Francisco, and another picture of Chinatown um, in 2012. Now, unfortunately, you're also going to see a growth in what is known as nativism. Nativists are people who were in the United States prior to this massive wave of immigrants. Um, they did not welcome the immigrants. They did not like them. They viewed them as dangerous to the American way of life. They also wanted immigrants to give up their own culture and language and assimilate. The Americanization movement was led by the government and concerned citizens. During this time, they established schools and volunteer organizations to teach the immigrants English, American history, and how the U.S. government worked. Social etiquette was also taught. The problem was that immigrants didn't want to give up their personal identities because of that was that was their culture. So what happened is conflicts occurred. Anti-immigration laws were established. They wanted stricter immigration laws and policies to limit who could come in the United States. Many nativists were of Anglo-Saxon descent, and they believed they were superior to all other ethnic groups. They did not object to immigrants from the right countries, so they considered the right countries to be Great Britain, Germany, and Scandinavian region. However, the wrong countries were Poland, Italy, China, and Japan. They also discriminated based on religion. Most Americans at this time were Protestant. They also thought that Catholics were a danger to democracy, and they felt that most of the, the Catholics would be loyal to the Pope. Anti-Semitism was also in the United States. Anti-Semitism means anti-Jewish. The American Protective Association, founded in 1887, um, you had members who spread anti-Catholic and anti-Jew propaganda. This is a picture at the bottom. So businesses, colleges, and social clubs refused to admit Catholics and Jews. If you notice here, this is um, a bunk, okay? Um, you've got different groups, and then you have China's Must Go. Can't read this. This is Uncle Sam's Lodging House. Okay, so this is Uncle Sam. Um, and then you have other people here. All right, so this uh, Irishman is screaming at the at Uncle Sam. Political effects. In 1894, Prescott F. Hall founded the Immigration Restriction League. Also, they influenced Congress to pass a bill that required immigrants to be literate in 1897. What does it mean to be literate? It means that these people had to know how to read. The president at the time, Grover Cleveland, vetoed it, but it gained a lot of support from um, other citizens and other people. And so what happened was a similar bill was passed in 1917. Nativists did not want immigrants to influence American politics because they didn't want uh, the, you know, America that they knew to end up like the other countries that these people fled from. Poll taxes and literacy, literacy tests were used to prevent immigrants from voting, just as they were used to prevent African Americans from voting. Now, another negative. Another negative side effect were known as political machines. These were established in major cities. For example, Irish Americans created Tammany Hall in New York City. It was ran by the Democratic Party. And we've talked about the Democrats. This uh, Tammany Hall provided immigrants with training, jobs, and cash if they voted for them in elections. So basically, it's bribery. <laughs> you see, 
Um, so that's what that's what's happening. They are training them. So if you notice this picture here, the local machine. All right. So it shows this person kind of on the back of this animal or beast, the tiger, and uh, he is kind of training him to go where he wants. Same thing uh, with the picture to the left. It says the brains that achieved the Tammany victory at the Rock, what does that say? Rock Hester Democratic Convention. And notice it's money, okay? By the way, this political machine still exists today. You just have to know where to find them. You just have to look. So, okay. William Boss Tweed was the most influential Tammany Hall boss. He was fourth generation Scots-Irish. He controlled New York City politics from the mid 1850s until 1871. So poli uh, political machines provided services to immigrants, but they did so, like I said, through corruption. Um, they paid these people off, which was technically illegal, okay? But we'll get into how they got away with that later. urbanization. So as you have an increase in immigration, these people are looking for jobs. Consider that the North, that's where they had the factories. The South had just come from a civil war and it was pretty much poverty. So most of the uh, immigrants came to the North and that created overpopulation and urbanization. Most occurred in the Northeast and Midwest. Between 1870 and 1920, population of uh, people living in the cities increased from 10 million to 54 million. Most immigrants lived in cities because it was close to their jobs and it was cheaper. However, by 1910, immigrants made up more than half of the total population of 18 major cities. That just shows you how many people um, had moved into the country. People living in rural areas also moved to the cities because they were look looking for work. Like I said, on the farms down in the south, um, they were pretty much suffering because they could not uh, pay things. So they moved to the north to look for work. By 1920, more people lived in urban areas than in rural areas. Also, many African Americans left the south and they moved north to escape the violence and racism that they were dealing with from the southern Democrats. Between 1890 and 1920, about 200,000 African Americans moved to cities such as Chicago and Detroit, but they still faced violence and discrimination. Okay. This is kind of an example, or this is an example, this is real, real photos um, of what life in these urban cities looked like. So cities' governments needed to provide residents with safe living conditions and services. What happened was many people lived in tenements, so they were kind of like apartment buildings, large buildings that offered many rooms for rent. Row houses were also built. They were homes for a single family but shared the walls of the other home. So these are um, another example. This is a row house, okay? We still have these today. Um, it's just a different name. Um, can't think of it right now. <laughs> anyway, this picture right here, this is an entrance to a tenement house, and this is um, tenements in New York City. Notice all the laundry here, okay? When families moved out of the city, immigrants moved into their old homes. Usually you had multiple families living in one home, so it was very overcrowded. All right. Tenements and homes became overcrowded. Cities passed laws to improve living conditions. In 1879, New York City passed a law that set standards for plumbing and ventilation in tenements. Because what was happening is um, when you have that many people living in an area, it, it's very dirty, okay? Um, and there's not very good sewage, I'll just say that, or plumbing. Uh, so you have a lot of um, smells. Okay, <laughs> if you get where I'm going. Um, tenements had to have air shafts that allowed fresh air in windows in each room. 
Some residents threw garbage in the air shafts, and that attracted rats, and it smelled really bad. Many residents nailed their windows shut. <laughs> if you look at the picture here, this is a family living in the attic, the attic of one of these tenement houses in 1905, because that's how desperate they were to find a place to live. Now, New York. This is this is one of the reasons that I just don't think I could I could live in New York because um, there's still a lot of people there. Okay, um, my husband has been in New York. He said it smells. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have ever been or you have family up there. Um, but anyway, life in the city during this time, since you have such an overpopulation of people, uh, some people threw garbage onto the streets. You also had sewage, uh, like feces and things like that, that flowed down the streets. Dead animals and horse manure would pile up because keep in mind at this point, um, they did not have a car, a lot of cars, so people still had horse and buggy. Cities were unsanitary and smelled bad. By 1910, many cities built sewer lines and formed sanitation departments to keep the streets clean, but sanitary living conditions still remained a problem. Some sewer lines dumped into bays and rivers that were used as water sources. So that means that unfortunately it got into the drinking water. Diseases like cholera, yellow fever, tuberculosis, and typhoid fever were common because unfortunately these people were literally drinking water that had been contaminated with feces. Okay, and if you don't know what that is, look it up. It's poo poo, okay. Overcrowded living conditions allowed these diseases to spread. About 25% of babies born in the late 1800s would die before turning one years old or one year old because of their um, exposure to some of these uh, things. Cities had a hard time providing clean drinking water. Some cities had built water lines, but the clean water was still a problem. Most people didn't have indoor plumbing. They had to use buckets and they had to go uh, to get water from the faucets on the streets and bring it back up into their tenement house or wherever they were living. Water filtration systems were not used until the 1870s and chlorine was not used to purify water until 1908. So that means they were literally drinking contaminated water. If you look here, these are boys in 1903 drinking from a public water pump in Washington, DC. Now, Obviously, when you have an overpopulated area, you have um, urbanization, you have poor water, um, it's going to lead to an increase in crime. Some people during this time stole for necessities. Um, other people just stole. First, uh, there was the first full-time paid police department established in New York City in 1844. And this is the group in the bottom. Other cities began to establish their own police officer uh, departments, but there were not enough police to stop the crimes because again, they were outnumbered. Okay, electricity was also not available to everybody. Um, most of these immigrants had to use candles for light and they also had to use kerosene heaters for warmth. Um, but unfortunately, this meant that sometimes it resulted in fires. If you've never seen like a kerosene lamp, it is basically just had some oil in there and it was uh, lit and they had to cover it but if that ever got knocked over or something happened it could easily result in a fire with all of these houses connected and with all of you saw the laundry and everything and you know how much stuff there was in the city it was very hard for a fire to stop from spreading once it began the first paid fire department was established in Cincinnati Ohio in 1853 and by 1900 most large cities had full-time fire department. In 1874, the automatic fire sprinkler began to be used. Stone, brick, and concrete replaced wood to build structures. All right. Social reformers wanted to help those living in urban areas. We have what is known as the social gospel movement. They preach that in order to find salvation, one must help the poor. In 1886, you have what are known as settlement houses that were established by Charles Stover and Stanton Coit in New York City. Settlement houses offered educational and social services. 
Some even offered health care. So if you look here in the picture, you've got Italian immigrants receiving instruction in English and they were trying to gain U.S. citizenship uh, circa 1920. Yep. All right, and last slide. Life in the city. So we have Jane Addams and Ellen Gates Starr, who founded Chicago's Whole House in 1889. The Whole House was kind of like a house for people who uh, were uh, homeless or needed help and things like that. Janie Porter Barrett founded the first settlement house for African Americans in 1890 in Hampton, Virginia, called Locust Street Social Settlement. This is Janie Porter Barrett. Over 400 settlement houses were opened in large cities across the country by 1910. And this will end our slides for uh, immigration and urbanization.